We're very pleased to have Renee Spronk with us this afternoon. She is a professional trainer focused on interoperability standards, including HL7 V2, FIRE, IHE, XDS, and DICOM. A few fun facts about Renee. Um, he has nearly three decades of experience in HL7 and has in, been involved in FIRE since its inception. And that, and uh, something I was not aware of until now is that Renee is the one who proposed the acronym FIRE. So we, we can now um, take pleasure in blaming him for all of the FIRE jokes and puns that we're subjected to. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to um, Renee for our presentation. All right. Well, thanks very much. And uh, indeed, well, you can blame me, but actually I was a volunteer in the marketing committee back uh, then when we thought of this. And uh, well, it has turned out pretty well and everybody is fired up. So let's get going on extensions. And extensions are a crucial part of the fire specification uh, because of our 80% rule. Um, as you know, one of the basic foundational uh, principles of FHIR is that we only include in our core resources those, those data elements that are contained in 80% or supported rather by 80% of systems worldwide. But it means automatically that if you create FHIR resources that do not include each and every edge use case, then it means that you have to have some extension mechanism. Now, most people who hear this, they go like, hey, yuck, I mean, you got a standard and then you have extensions. Okay, extensions are a dirty word or a dirty thing in the context of standards. But that's not necessarily true, because what do we hate about such extensions is that they're private, they're secret, they're vendor specific, like Z segments in HL7 version 2, if you know HL7 version 2, or private groups in DICOM. Now, lots of standards have these creepy little extension things. So the thing is that out of the box, when you think have this principle of we want to keep the simple things simple and thereby focus on this 80% most common use cases, right? But it means that if you have, are going to have extensions and we know we need extensions, then at least you have to make them elegant. That's my wording for it, elegant extensions. And how do you make it elegant? Well, certainly one of the things you're going to require is to make it mandatory that you publish the definition of your extension. So that at least if you receive something that has an extension and you don't know what it is, as a receiver, you can look it up somewhere in a public registry. And we'll talk about those registries here as well. Now, if you look at this slide, then yes, catering for the 80% means defining something, a resource that is of relevance in healthcare. And yes, it contains data elements, those data elements that we recognize as being of use in most systems. But if you have a use case that's not so very standard, like our little uh, Lego uh, image here, that's not so terribly standard, but that means that at least we have the option using these extensions to define and support such things. So to make the use of these fire extensions uh, safe and manageable, that's why you have to have the structure definition. You probably know that term from uh, profiling. If you use the conformance level uh, layer in fire, then we have a structure definition resource to express the structure of extensions amongst other things. So you have to publish that, but it's a shoot which essentially means, it's not a shell, but a shoot, which essentially means that you should publish it. And if you don't, you have to have a darn good reason basically for not publishing it. Most projects you will find that use these extensions will actually publish them in one of the large public registries, like registry.fire.org or in simplifier.net. Those are two of the largest public open registries for structure definitions. But it's not mandatory that you actually publish it there. You could publish your extension definition in your own public registry. But at least it should be able, people should be able to find the documentation of your extension somewhere. Not everything obviously should be an extension. I mean, if something is in the 80%, then you shouldn't duplicate that in your extension. And therefore it's good guidance, uh, good practice effectively, to start looking at these public registries 
and try to determine if the thing that you need is already supported either by one of the data elements in the 80% in the core model or in one of the predefined extensions. And I can tell you from my own experience that sometimes when I fool around with a resource that I'm not terribly familiar with, then I'm actually totally in doubt whether the thing I need is actually some standard data element or whether I need an extension or not. Well, that's why we have chat.fire.org, so at least you can always ask the experts as, uh, as to what the best mapping should be. But yes, if you define an extension, and we have seen this before, like in the Netherlands, we've defined some extensions, and then they found out in Argentina and in Portugal that actually what these Dutch guys have created in terms of an extension, we might as well reuse that because they have already defined it. There's no sense in reinventing the wheel, right? Now let's start with simple extensions. So the simple extensions are a category, if you want, of extensions, and they're actually a key value pair, and that goes for basically all extensions. And the extension, or the key rather, is a URL, and it has to be a full-blown URL, and you're not allowed to use a URN. So it's tempting maybe to use an OID or a UUID as an identifier or some other human readable string, but that's not the intent here. The requirement is that it shall be a full loan URL. The value of our key value pair is any data type that exists in Fire. So it's up to the definition of the extension to define what the data type then is for that particular key, that particular URL in this case. Such extensions, like any extensions, can be used on a data element or they can be used within a data type. So you could say, although formally we don't have that distinction, that we can extend either a resource by a new data element or that we can extend a data element by extending, for example, the data type that it uses. Simple example of that, of a simple extension, um, is place of birth for a patient. Now, this is uh, especially if important, let's say, in a lot of European countries, but hey, it's just an example, so it doesn't really matter that much. We want to capture the city and the country of birth. And why do you want to do that? Well, under most legislation, obviously, this thing doesn't change. Your city of birth doesn't change, and therefore, it's a very good character, demographic characteristics. So this is taken directly from one of the public registries, in this case, simplifier.net. It's just a screenshot. And we see the definition of this extension. We see the canonical URL, and the canonical URL, that is the key, effectively, that identifies my extension. So please note this is canonical URL, so the URL does not have to work, so to speak, if you were to put this in a browser, right? It serves as a unique identifier for this extension. And the extension consists of a URL, and the URL has a fixed value, because it's this value, and the, in this case, the data type was defined to be the data type address. And you can guess what it contains, and amongst other things, it contains city and country. And if we look at an example of this, then uh, in JSON in this case, we see the key, and the key being the URL, and we have a value, and in this case, the only part of the address that has been populated, um, is our city, in this case, Amsterdam. You can also extend a data type. So some extensions have been explicitly defined to extend uh, data types. So in this case, another Dutch example, uh, which is to uh, basically mark one of the addresses that the patient has as being the official address. And you go official address. Well, quite a few countries have this concept of a government registry of your official name and your official address, etc. But when you go to the hospital, you may actually provide the hospital with multiple addresses because the official address may not be where you actually live. But one of the addresses needs to have a flag put on them there. It goes like, oh, this is the official address because there is no other way of doing it. So we see again a screenshot from this open registry for address official. And it's a Boolean uh, extension, and the Boolean extension basically uh, allows us to state uh, in uh, well, uh, either true or false whether a particular address is uh, the official address or not. 
Example, so here we have the patient resource with multiple addresses. Only one is shown, but we can then tag this extension on the data type to basically, as I said, define this single address, this specific address to be the official one. Now next to simple extensions, well, if we talk about simple extensions, we must also have complex extensions, and we do. And there's still a key value pair, and the key is still a URL, but the value is a complex or a set of extension paths. So we're talking about a multifaceted extension. And the identity of the parts of the extension, okay, those are local or relative to the URL. So for those extension paths, uh, we don't have to uh, define a full-blown URL anymore. Okay, so uh, let's have a look at uh, a complex extension. So these are nations where the patient claims citizenship. Um, so this is an extension which has a URL and we see the extension paths and the extension paths are code and period. So code to identify the nation that you are a citizen of and period as a period data type from to when you are actually a citizen of that particular country. Example of the, uh, an instance of it, and here we see the, uh, the URL, uh, which is for patient citizenship. We have the period, which starts in 2009, and we have the code. So here you see the two names that are relevant to the URL or relative to the URL, code and period. Those are relative to this URL. And we have the code, which is DE, in this case, for Germany. There is a special case. So these extensions are relatively simple in terms of processing. If you as a receiver don't know the extension, you effectively just ignore it and go like, well, it's just some extra bits of information, so I can ignore it if I don't know about it. And that's cool. But there is a special category of extensions, and those are known as modifier extensions. And those are dangerous in the sense that they modify the meaning or the intent of the core 80% that's in the resource. In other words, danger. If you don't know the modifier extension, then you're actually not allowed, you should not process the content of that resource. Famous example shown here at the bottom of the slide is the anti-prescription. Normally a prescription resource, officially the medication request resource, right, says administer this patient uh, or this medication to the patient. But if you have a modifier extension, then that actually may state not. So do never provide this medication to the patient. Obviously, that radically changes the interpretation, the whole functionality of that resource, right? So hence, it's known as a modifier extension. And if you look at an instance of it, um, here we have the, uh, the URL, the canonical URL of the extension, then you see that the name of the element is now modifier extension. So a receiver or somebody who looks at the fire resource that was created by somebody else should also always verify if somewhere in this fire resource there is a modifier extension. Because if so, you cannot actually, you don't know the modifier extension, then you should either maybe raise an error or uh, just display the textual part of the fire resource in the hope that at least that will state that it's about an entire prescription. But you cannot just process it. So there are huge patient safety issues around the use of modifier extensions. So be careful. Now, extensions, obviously, if you have them in a fire resource, and what if you want to query for them? Well, they're certainly not part of the standard uh, query parameters or search parameters that are defined for, let's say the example we have here at the bottom, for patients to, clear, to use a query parameter for citizen of, well, we have already seen the example, that was an extension to define your citizenships. And Modder's maiden name is another extension. So you will have to talk essentially or configure your server to support these additional search parameters. But out of the box, they are very unlikely to actually support this. So talk basically to your server if you wish to search on extension values. Now, a bit of an edge use case. 
Okay, but what if you wanted to extend extensions? Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, uh, just about any use case where you would be using extensions, uh, you might then also use uh, extensions on extensions. Okay, the management thereof gets a bit hairy if you take it too far, like extensions, 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 etc. But let's say, for example, we have a, a, an extension that's used at the national level, like in the US, and the extension mandates the use of a particular coding system. But you and your system, you go like, well, that's nice to have this at the national level, this coding system, but I need to have in my system a different coding system. So you use then the US national extension with the national coding system, but you extend that particular extension to also include your own code from your own coding system. And that's fine because people that process that resource can then either use the national one or if they use your extension extension they will also be able to process your local code so to speak another one is data absent reason and we'll look at that there is a whole set of generic extensions that are let's say more infrastructural in nature and could basically be used in any fire resource and one of those is data absent reason I cannot provide you with a normal value because I'm not allowed to tell you, or I'm supposed to give you a number, but it's positive infinity. So that's a, not a normal value that I can give you. So data absent reason is a special extension that's predefined in the standard uh, for use uh, a bit of an infrastructural nature. You can also extend the meta information in a fire resource. Again, a bit of an edge use case, but just so you know. You know that the metadata is mostly not part of the versioning. So if you update meta, that does not change the overall version of your fire resource. So there are a few caveats around uh, extending meta, but you can. Now, I talked about these general extensions. Those are the extensions that are, uh, have been defined in the standard for use in any resource. And it's actually quite a long, or actually this is back to the data absent reason. Sorry, forgot about that slide. So we may have, have multiple codes as to why we don't have actually a normal value. So these are all exceptional uh, values and uh, they're taken from a particular coding system, uh, data absent reason. And near the bottom, we actually see our URL, the canonical URL for data absent reason. So as to why we don't have a normal value. This is one of the general extensions. And there's actually a whole list of them. Uh, we have uh, things like uh, body site or geolocation or translation. Obviously, if you're in a multilingual environment, uh, you may have to do translations. Um, relative date, language, etc. And it's actually a pretty long list. And I, personally, I was a bit surprised to actually find this in our specification uh, because I've never seen the, patient, the page before. But actually here, there is a page that just documents all of these uh, generic extensions, right? So here we have, for example, we have a very generic one that allows me to identify for any fire resource a replacement uh, extension to link it to some other fire resource that this fire uh, resource is a replacement of. Well, very generic extension and hence very nice to have uh, as part of the international standard. So extensions can be used uh, nearly everywhere, but not absolutely on all resources. There are a few exceptions to the rule. And uh, those are actually uh, the bundle parameters and binary resources. And why is it not available on those? Well, it's something to do with the, the hierarchy of how fire resources are defined, but it's done on purpose in this fashion uh, because bundle parameters and binary are, well, special resources that do not have any semantics of their own. And hence the idea was that they also wouldn't need any extensions. You can disagree with that, but that's how it has been defined. So we have new extensions. And uh, what if we want to define a new resource? Aha, ah, 200 resources in fire. And you go like, no, 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 no. I have a use case that's unique to my environment or my country or project. 
and I need an entirely new resource. So how do you do that? Well, actually, there are a couple of ways of doing this. The official way is to use the basic resource. So there is a basic resource in the FHIR standard, and it's only there for the reason of that it can be extended. Well, this FHIR resource, if you look at it, it's fairly minimalistic. So it's intended for you to add and define your own complex extension with multiple data elements, multiple facets, and basically add that as an extension to a basic resource, thereby you effectively have created your own proprietary resource if you want. And the code here, this code attribute here, which is mandatory, contains a code that identifies what type of new resource I have just effectively defined. This may sound a bit abstract, so let's give you an example. This is an example defined by uh, Cerner, and uh, they use basic extended with new fields, and you see the new complex extension here, to um, detail the details of a work shift. So the work shift, the morning shift, or the afternoon shift, or the night shift, uh, let's say in hospital environment, and so they wish to define a shift as having a name and a particular start and end time. Well, you cannot express this, this concept of shift, using any of the other fire resources. So hence they start thinking, hmm, okay, so how are we going to do that? We effectively need a new resource type for this. But it's not something where you want to go to the fire or to HL7 and go like, well, please officially define this new resource. Okay, because it's still fairly project specific, probably. Well, anyway, so that's why they use basic with an extension and effectively create or define their own resource type. Here's another one. This is patient preferences. And this is something that we use more often in all sorts of training courses. Because, you know, Firely provides lots of fire training courses. So um, this is one where, for example, you can have a preference for a room type. I want to have a single room with sea view. And you go like, what? Do we have that in healthcare? Yes, there are countries where you can actually express such a preference. Or the newspaper that you want to have delivered to your bed each morning, the International New York Times. Well, that sort of information is simply not, how do you capture that? Do you stick that as an extension on the patient? Well, patient resource is about demographics. What newspaper you read, that's certainly not demographic, so it doesn't really belong there, right? So that's why we have a new basic resource extended with a complex extension, but now the code indicates that we're talking about a basic resource of the type patient preferences. And we can query for the patient preferences because that's one of the predefined search parameters for basic. Now, obviously, there are people who are going to cheat, okay? So then some people, when I talk about this slide, they go like, don't tell them that. Well, actually, yes, you can cheat. You can just define your own resource, just give it a name, just use it in any, uh, like any other resource, you do a get, a put, or whatever, just a restful exchange of your own resource with your own name. Well, that's fine. It may very well work in your own little environment. But just be aware, obviously, that none of the tooling basically supports this. Okay, some of the tools can be tweaked to support these uh, additional resources, these custom resources, right? But out of the box, certainly this sort of stuff is not supported. Now, you may have to do uh, profiling. Well, actually, extensions are kind of profiling. That sounds a bit strange, that actually when you define an extension, you are constraining the standard. You have to scratch a bit on your head and go like, what? If I define an extension, then I'm actually constraining? Well, yes, because out of the box, if you look at the fire resource, then the fire resource allows you to have any extension of any definition in any place in this fire resource. So that's like my little Lego model here on the left. It's the red little base plate, and then there is lots of stuff that could potentially happen on top of that. So if I define a specific extension to be this flag, 
then I'm effectively constraining because I'm no longer allowing everything willy nilly to appear. No, I'm now stating no, it's this specific extension. And hence, it's effectively a constraint. And that's why extensions are defined using the very same profiling tools that we use to, well, deal with any profiling in the fire specification. So, for example, with Forge. So profiling extensions, where you define a new extension in the profiling tool, well, yes, you have to define a canonical URL, key value pair, so you have got to have a key. Uh, the cardinality of the extension value, so if you go like, well, it has, uh, the value is a coded concept, then, well, how many codes are we allowed to provide? Or if it's an address, it's just one address, or an optional address, or a mandatory address, or whatever. Um, but you can also define that when you use this extension, let's say in the patient resource, then at that point in time, you can also identify, well, how many times may I have the extension as a whole? That's also part of your profiling and uh, constraint mechanism. And you have to define where that extension may be used. May it be used, let's say, in the patient resource, or may it only be used in the address data type, or whatever. So there's a certain context to each and every extension where it has been used. So if you try to apply it elsewhere and you validate the instance and you'll actually will see an error message because you're then using the extension in an illegal context. So I talked about the documentation. You should document essentially uh, where uh, you should document the structure of your extension. So how do I get hold of that? Well. First of all, the easiest actually, the canonical URL, okay, which just acts as an identifier really, may actually work if you use it in your browser. There's no guarantee that it will work, but it's kind of nice. So if you can arrange that when you create your own extensions, that's certainly a nice thing. That if people use it in their browser, they will either get hold of a structure definition, or maybe will be redirected to an HTML page that informs them of what this extension actually means. There are public registries, okay, simplifier.net, registry.fire.org, relatively well known in the FIRE community, so that's where you can find all sorts of definitions in all sorts of projects. So you do a search, essentially, in those registries on the canonical URL. You can also try the FIRE specification itself. Because FHIR itself, the FHIR specification, defines quite a few extensions. And again, people start scratching their head and going, well, what? So we have a standards body that defines standards. And they also, they have a rule that says this 80% type of thing. But then they also define the extensions themselves. Yeah. Why is it not in the core? Well, the thing is, these extensions that we have are applicable in multiple settings and countries but they're not part of the 80%. But because they are used in different countries and different settings, you still wish to sort of define these extensions at some central level in the fire specification itself. So there may be extensions that are defined there, and obviously there could be project and vendor specific registries. For example, if you're a national standardization body, uh, in the US or in the UK or wherever you are, then it may actually be that they have their own repository or registry of extension and structure definitions. And the easiest way to mostly get there, if you don't already know where to find that, is to just Google uh, using the canonical URL, which is effectively a unique identifier. So that will hopefully get you to some registry that at least holds the definition of the extension. But the key word is, you should be a structure definition. Now to summarize what we have, well, extensions, and they exist because of the 80-20 rule, they are normal. So extensions are not a dirty word, as they are in most other standards. And we try to basically establish more an elegant way, basically, of dealing with these extensions by forcing you effectively to uh, define or publish the definition of your extension. We have simple ex uh, extensions, complex extensions, and we have modifier extensions. And again, be warned when it comes to modifier extensions, because they can have some 
rather creepy side effects if you don't know what the modifier extension actually is. If you want to create your own new resource, then that's a basic ex uh, resource and the basic resource can be extended uh, with a complex extension mostly to create your own resource. Or if you want to cheat, you can define your own custom resource, but then you're on your own. I mean, there's no support from HL7 nor from the tooling side basically to do that. And servers may support extensions as query parameters. Okay, so that completes our presentation. There were a few questions in the Q&A, so let's have a look at those. Uh, question was, how does a validator know what the uh, custom profiles exist or what the extensions are? Well, obviously, if you have a validator, then the validator has to know where to find these extensions. So either if you're validating using a fire server, then you have to make this extension definition available on that fire server or in some other way, inform the validator as to where the definitions are. Okay. So can extensions be searchable? Well, we already talked about that. Right. So just to recap, perhaps, the stuff that we have seen in this uh, um, presentation, okay, I have just to see whether you have to allow you to review on your own. I have prepared a little quiz with questions and we are going to play the thumbs up, thumbs down game. Now, if this was a full-fledged Zoom environment, I would see all of your thumbs. But in this case, we're just going to use this as a starting point to review some of the key points. Question number one. The 80% rule implies that 20% of the data is expressed as extensions. The 80% rule implies that 20% of the data is expressed as extensions. True or false? Well, obviously it's false, right? The 80% rule is a rule of thumb that basically goes like, well, if a data element is implemented in 80% of systems worldwide, it's gonna be in core and everything else is going to be extensions. As to realistically in implementations, how, uh, what the amount of data that's on the extensions versus the core data, well, that's quite a different question that I don't simply know the answer to. You should publish the definition of an extension. Yes or no? Well, absolutely. You know that it's not a shell, but it's a should, right? Because there could be circumstances in some projects where you actually don't want to define your extensions and then it's fine, but you have to have a very good reason. That's effectively what FIRE says. If you don't have a good reason, publish it, because you never know who's going to use the extension or who will be able to reuse your extension if you have defined a very nice extension. A tricky one. Adding a modifier extension to an existing resource may cause it to be unprocessable by other systems adding a modifier extension to an existing resource may cause it to be unprocessable by other systems. Well, definitely that is one of the dangers. Okay? Modifier extensions are very problematic, so you got to watch it. And Renee, we do have five minutes left. Excellent. We can extend extended extensions. Yes, you hit that right. We can extend extended extensions. Well, definitely you can extend uh, to your, well, to whatever recursive depth that you may wish to use. The observation resource could be remodeled as a basic resource with extensions. The observation resource could be remodeled as a basic resource with extensions. Well, you could obviously have the same content as what you have in an observation resource in a basic resource with extensions, but hey, that's what we have the observation for. So obviously in an extension, you're never going to do what you already have in one of the core elements. So don't try that at home. And the final one, and that's one of the key things that we have presented today, an extension is effectively a constraint. And that's certainly true. Strange, but true. An extension is a constraint. 
So let me see if we have any remaining questions. I will respond to some of those uh, questions that were posed uh, after the end of this tutorial. So not to worry. Okay, but I think we responded to all of them. So with that, I say thank you and I hope you will enjoy the remaining presentations for today. And uh, extensions, it's one of those little things that seems so simple, but is yet so very powerful. So thank you and see you around during the other presentations during this death day. All right, thank you very much, Rene. And <clears throat> as you mentioned, um, the uh, the Q and A questions in Whova will be persistent, so he'll be monitoring those and making sure those get answered. And um, as you also mentioned, go ahead and check your agenda in Whova to get to your next meeting. Thank you all for attending, and have a great day. Okay, and don't forget the surveys. Uh, okay, right, that was the other thing to fill in the survey forms. But yes, see you around by all means. Enjoy.